Hello, and welcome to our virtual tour of the Wolcott Keepers House in Ottawa County, Ohio. We're here in Danbury Township on Bayshore Road along the shores of Lake Erie and Sandusky Bay. There is a lot of frontier history here in Ottawa County, and specifically Bayshore Road has a lot to see. Let's visit a few of those spots. From the Wolcott Keepers House, just down the street to our west, you'll find Battlefield Park. The War of 1812 with the British had its first skirmish here on the peninsula. A small group of soldiers from Connecticut in the area were attacked by Indians. <laughs> The battle left eight soldiers and about 40 Indians dead. One of the soldiers to survive was 17-year-old Joshua Giddings, who later as an Ohio congressman placed a monument at the battle site. Today a fenced area marks Battlefield Park, which holds the Giddings Monument, an Ohio historical marker, and the graves of the eight soldiers killed. Now from the Keeper's House going east on Bayshore Road, you'll find the Marblehead Lighthouse. They say it's the most photographed spot in Ohio, and it is this lighthouse that provides us the connection with the Wolcott Keeper's house. Let's begin our tour with Benazia Wolcott. Who was he and how did he get here? As Ottawa County's first permanent colonial settler, Benazia initially came here as part of a team to survey what is called the Firelands. That is, the land given to those who had their Connecticut homes burned during the Revolutionary War. As a Revolutionary War veteran himself, with no money, no trade, and no land, Benazia supported himself and his family in any available odd job. An unsuccessful saddle maker's shop led Benazia to believe the Fireland survey was his way out. He liked what he saw here on the peninsula and purchased land on Sandusky Bay, which included orchards planted by the French and maintained by the native population. In the winter of 1809, he brought his wife, Elizabeth Bradley, two daughters and a son, and two hired hands to the frontier. They traveled by sleigh from Danbury, Connecticut to Cleveland, Ohio during the winter month of February. Elizabeth and the children stayed in Cleveland, and Benazia and his hired hands continued onto the shore of Sandusky Bay. There they built cabins for the family. Elizabeth and the children came by boat the following spring. Years of hard work and difficult times followed. With the War of 1812 looming, the family fled to Newburgh, Ohio, which is a southern suburb of Cleveland. Unfortunately, Elizabeth died in Newburgh, and a well-justified fear of a British and Indian invasion kept Benazia and the children in Newburgh until 1815. When they returned to the Danbury Peninsula, they found all the farms ravaged by Indians and backwoods desperados. Legend has it that only the Wolcott cabin was left standing because of Benazia's great friendship with the Wyandotte chief Ogons. Now a widower with three children ages around 17, 15, and 9, starting over was not easy. He applied and received a pension for Revolutionary War veterans. In testimony given before the Huron County Common Pleas Court, Benazia asserted rheumatism and other infirmities. His affidavit states that I am an old man and my circumstances in life are low. With this pension, life began to improve. Enter the Marblehead Lighthouse. Completed in 1822, Benazia was appointed the lighthouse's first keeper by President James Monroe. In March of that year, the now prosperous Benazia married Rachel Miller, a school teacher from Sandusky. He then hired William Kelly. Sandusky's first stonemason and the builder of the lighthouse, to build them a new house. Two children were born of this marriage, Elizabeth and Henry. After serving 10 years as lighthouse keeper, Benazia Wolcott died unexpectedly in 1832 of cholera, we think probably contracted by giving Christian burial to corpses washed ashore. Benazia and later other members of his family were buried in the family cemetery, which is located down the road behind the house. Rachel survived Benazia and was appointed the first female lighthouse keeper on the Great Lakes. 
She continued to live in the keeper's house until the 1850s. The generations that lived in the house after Wolcott's death in 1832 apparently had an appreciation for the significance of the structure, for few changes were made to it. The home and surrounding land was purchased by the Ottawa County Historical Society in 1989 and restoration commenced. The Wolcott Keeper's House is believed to be the oldest residence in Ottawa County and perhaps northwestern Ohio. Few buildings remain from the northwest Ohio's early 19th century settlement period. Even fewer provide us with a degree of historic and architectural significance present in the Venetia Wolcott House. The Wolcott Keeper's House has been placed on the National Register of Historical Places and has received an Ohio Historical Society roadside marker. It is now owned by Danbury Township and is operated by the Ottawa County Historical Society. Now let's begin our tour of the house. A little background on the builder. Not only did William Kelly build the Wolcott Keeper's House, but he built the Marblehead Lighthouse and several old stone dwellings in Sandusky. Although the house has been called the Old Stone Fort, it never served as a fortress. The four inches by four inches openings at the four corners of the house were not musket portals as legend would have it, but rather demonstrate a building technique first brought to Europe from the Middle East by the Crusaders in the 11th century. These indentations serve as a starting place for wooden scaffolding to make repairs to the exterior of the structure and to the roof. The house itself, using local materials and knowledge, is a rare intact example of colonial hall and parlor design. The limestone building material was quarried on site. The heavy timber support beams, both in the foundation and above, are hand-hewn chestnut, oak, and walnut, and were no doubt harvested on site or nearby. The principal support beam under the house measures 13 inches by 9 inches by 43 feet and is one solid piece of white oak of over 38 cubic feet mass. The original interior woodwork, window seats, 6 over 6 window configuration, and fireplace with mantel are all evidence of the federal architectural design. Over the years, the society has acquired a number of items representative of early frontier life. For example, an 1816 tall clock, a spinning wheel, a handmade bed cover, and a musket. Another wonderful area in the house is the restored hearth. Benazia was said to possess innate good humor and a congenial disposition. Foremost among his social graces was the ability to enliven any occasion with the playing of the fiddle. The pioneer records of the Firelands are punctuated with accounts of his musical abilities. During the early years, nearly every account of a Firelands gathering contains the reference, the music was furnished by Mr. Walcott of the Peninsula. An early Huron County lawyer, Mr. Joseph Root, in 1863 said of his old friend Benazia, he was an honest, industrious, and cheerful man, tried to be happy himself and to make others happy. He sometimes played on the violin, and as I thought, well... With this instrument, he used to while away many hours of the long night watches, which he had to keep at the lighthouse. Hi, I'm Becky Shemensky. I'm the member of the Ottawa County Historical Society who does the hearth cooking. We cook, demonstrate, and sample the things that we cook. Rick Yakar, another one of our members, is responsible for the fire building and maintaining the fire to the temperature we need to cook. That is a very um, important part of the cooking. Um, there are often others who help in these endeavors, but basically there's uh, this, the two or three of us. Sally Williams instituted the hearth cooking. She um, researched recipes, took classes, uh, got others to go to class with her, and um, when it became necessary for Sally to turn the reins over, she enlisted the help of Ray and G Georgette McCarr. And as happens, they, uh, when they um, wanted uh, a less a committed lifestyle, 
they recruited me to take over, which was an easy thing to do since I love to cook. The Historical Society put together some of Sally's researched recipes and published a small cookbook, which we l use almost exclusively in our cooking. The thing to remember with hearth cooking is that it is always approximate. It is um, a lower heat and a slower tempo. Think of, of, uh, of crock pots and slow cookers. This kind of cooking is basic and is difficult to ruin. It is for those who like to cook with instinct and enjoyment. We wear authentic costumes when we're showcasing hearth cooking. And since the dresses are long, there has to be great care taken not to ignite the hem of the dress or the apron. The, a fire extinguisher and a pail of water is always available. So far, we've never needed them. Uh, long leather gloves, similar to welding gloves, are used to handle the pots and pans. We use cast iron pots and pans, and they're very heavy. So uh, when moving them, you have to be sure that you're prepared to lift them safely. Since I can no longer do that, I make sure there's someone stronger than I am when needed. Some of the other things we use in our cooking is this oven. It, it is a completely um, a stone-lined oven that has to be prepared properly, but it is a baking oven and we have made bread in it. Um, this is for toasting bread. Yes, they didn't have electric toasters then. They have a griddle and a big griddle. And this is the big um, Dutch oven that we use to make pies. Uh, the types of foods that we prepare are primarily things that we can share because when we have events, we sample our cooking so people can see uh, how hearth cooking turns out just mm -hmm. fine. In the fall, um, we have an event where people enjoy sampling applesauce, apple pies, and apple cider. Um, then in July, we have another event where the Rotary Club sells perch dinners, and we usually focus on baking desserts and cookies so as not to compete with the dinners, and, and we uh, sample those to the people that attend. June is the time of year where we highlight hearth cooking exclusively. Uh, at that time, we cook a big pot of stew or soup and make biscuits or johnny cake or cornbread to serve with it so that people see how we can put together a meal with this hearth cooking. We have cast iron tea kettles, which we use to heat our cider or to make other hot beverages. In all of our endeavors, we strive to be authentic, staying true to the foods and the implements that our ancestors would have used. As examples, we use lard instead of uh, shortening or Crisco. And we have to be mindful that some spices would not have been available at that time. It is great fun to experiment with this type of cooking. It has certainly given me more respect for my ancestors and an appreciation for modern appliances. Enjoy taking some time to slow your life and try hearth cooking or stop by when we're having an event and share in some of the samples that we have available. From the house, a short walkway will take us to what we call the Annex. In the Annex, you'll find a small gift shop and a number of Frontier items on display. A particular interest is the collection of Frontier farming equipment. Hi, welcome to the Annex portion of our virtual tour of the Keeper's House. The Annex is a separate building off to the side of the Keeper's House where we maintain many of the old artifacts that have been collected from this area involving the way the pioneers used to live. So what we've done is we've brought some of them out here, some of the more interesting ones. We have many more back in the, in the building. Uh, when it's time to personally visit 
the keeper's house and the annex will will have those you can see many more things in there but let's just start with a few uh, here for this virtual tour this collection of material over here involves the agriculture agricultural industry that was going on in the early days of Ottawa County uh, of course we say industry meaning not so much like you would think of an industry today as a like cor run by corporations in those days agriculture was run by families by individuals so uh, what we have I'll show you first one of the oldest artifacts we have which is this right here this is now you've probably seen no doubt farmers pulling disc harrows through the fields and prior to disc harrows they used to use the um, a, a, a different type of harrow which had a steel claw like contraption on it and they would pull that through the field to break up the clods and the, this is the, or, the original type of harrow that farmers used. It is a piece of wood with steel spikes driven through it. And the spikes would break up the clods as the harrow was pulled through the field. This board that the spikes are driven through would be lying down like this, all the way down on the ground. The farmer would put heavy stones on here and pull this with a horse and the horse would pull pull this through the field and break up the clods so uh, this was the original harrow that farmers used once they got the soil prepared for planting they had a number of different types of planters and here is just one of them this was for planting corn they would fill this box full of seed corn and when they were getting ready to go down the row they would first open this and that would that would convert the bottom of the planter into almost like a blade they would jam the blade into the ground then close when they closed the blade opened up into a made a big gap between the two sides of the blade at the same time a mechanical arm going through the bottom of the seed box would release one seed to go down this tube right here and fall into the all in, fall into the gap so this was a corn planter pretty inventive after planting of course you had to keep the weeds down and this is an old-fashioned hoe as you can see it's much bigger than a modern day hoe but they wanted to get as much work done as they could so they made the hose nice and big so they would weed with this hoe to keep the weeds out of the out of the fields and uh, then after it was time to harvest they would use a sickle to harvest cutting the corn off down at ground level and then they would stack the corn into stacks and allow it to dry in the field. The stacks would just stand in the field and then the corn would dry. They didn't have uh, corn cribs until later. Corn cribs uh, were later came along as a way of drying the corn. So, in addition to corn, of course, they had wheat and hay. And the way wheat and hay were harvested were with a scythe. A scythe is operated by pulling it quickly along the ground and the blade cuts the stalks off at ground level. You can imagine trying to do an entire field with one of these things. These people worked, <laughs> worked hard. <clears throat> after, the, after the hay or wheat was harvested, or cut it had to be picked up and put into a wagon and that was done with a pitchfork this pitchfork is made out of wood and it has iron tines on the ends of, of the three legs 
which were made by a blacksmith and fastened on here. So this was a pitchfork. So that, this gives you some example of what it was like to cultivate crops on the farm in the pioneer days. They also, people slaughtered their own animals and made meat and sausage. What we have here are examples of sausage stuffers. This one here is, is one of the older ones. This sausage stuffer had a, uh, a, a square platform that was connected to the end of this handle. And out at this end of the handle, you could get leverage and force the sausage down in that square container. A sausage casing was fit over this pipe and as you forced the sausage down in this little tub, the sausage would come out and fill the s sausage, uh, fill the uh, casing. Later on, of course, manufactured sausage stuffers such as this one came along. This one operates with a what's called an Acme thread. As you turn the crank, the Acme thread forces a plate down into the tub, forcing the sausage to come out the tube at the end where the sausage casing was positioned. So that is some of the tools that we have. Those, those are some of the tools that we have that uh, involve agriculture. There were many other tools th that were used every day for various things. And, and we have those, a few of examples of those over here. This is a broom made of honeysuckle. And they used to make brooms out of all kinds of things. Uh, one of the fav favorite things to make brooms out of was corn stalks. They would s slice the corn stalks into little strips and make corn, uh, what they call corn brooms out of them. The original brooms were not flat like this one is flat. The original brooms were actually round and uh, it was only when the, when the shakers invented the flat broom that flat brooms became popular. The Shakers were a, a, uh, a, a strict religious sect that lived mostly in New York State and they invented a lot of things, uh, including the flat broom and the circular saw. Prior to them, all sawing was done with the reciprocating up and down saw or back and forth saw. Even the ones that were attached to mills or steam engines and the, the Shakers invented the circular saw. On every farm, of course, there were wagons, and in every, any kind of enterprise, there were wagons for moving goods. If a wheel broke or an axle broke and you needed to do a repair on a, on a wagon or a buggy, there was a device called a buggy jack. And what this is, this used to, this is all corroded now, but it used to have steps on it like this. You would put these, slide this under the corner of the buggy or wagon and raise it up with the step catching the corner of the buggy and use this leverage to raise up the, the corner of the buggy so that you could change the wheel or do whatever repair you needed to do. This is a very clever, very clever tool. Another very important tool was the grinder. This grinder was operated by somebody sitting on a seat and pedaling, just like you pedal a bicycle. There was a drive belt that came up and uh, drove, drove the spindle and turned the grinder. The person would sit on here, pedal, and hold his blade up against the grindstone. <coughs> Excuse me. This was a very important tool because all the tools that were used in those days were mostly handmade and hand maintained, so everything had to be sharpened. Another of the great industries of Ottawa County was the logging industry. 
the trees that grew in the Great Black Swamp, some of them were five or six feet in diameter. And when those were cut down, the, you had to have the right kind of tools to work with them. This first tool here is a two-man cross-cut saw. A two-man cross-cut saw would have a man on each end and the, when one man pulled, the other man just let go, just uh, relaxed. He didn't let go, he relaxed. And then the second man would pull and the first man would relax. And they would reciprocate back and forth to saw. That's how they sawed down all these big trees. Or to, to saw vertically, they would saw this way to saw into the trees. Now, I, I grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania and I actually used one of these things with my brothers and it is hard work <laughs> but very effective after trees were cut down of course they had to be the logs had to be moved you had to move them by rolling this device was used to roll the logs you would jam that hook this hook right here you would jam into the wood and then roll the log. That's how you move the wood around. Once you had the wood in position, a broad axe was used to chop away the bark and make beams out of it. And later on, if you wanted boards made, you'd have to take them to the mill. But to make beams, you would use a broad axe and chop away the bark. Into, into squares. This device is called an adze, and this was for more refined chopping away of the wood to make a, fine, a finer surface. Uh, if you've seen old, in old barns, you may have seen hewn beams, hand-hewn beams. This is how they made those hand-hewn beams. <clears throat> Of course, barns were very important. And when they built barns, the beams had to be put together with big wooden, wooden dowels. And this auger was used to drill holes into the beams. And then wooden dowels were carved and, plate, and hammered through those holes. And that's how the beams were put together. One of the major industries in Ottawa County was barrel making. Uh, <clears throat> because of, the, because of the, uh, the, the abundance of wood in this area, uh, barrels, uh, barrel factories sprang up all over the county. And w this tool right here is called a draw knife. There are many different kinds of and sizes of draw knives, but these were used by the man, the man pulling this th across the wood and shaving off a, an am a certain amount of wood to make whatever he was making. In making barrels, barrels involve many compound curves and angles to make the boards that go together so that you have a barrel shape. It, it takes a real artisan to make those to make a barrel, and the, those artisans were called coopers. So a cooper is a barrel maker. You may ask, well, why did they make so many barrels? Why couldn't they have just made crates? It would have been so much easier. The reason is that barrels, because they're round, are very easily transported. You can tip a barrel down on its side and roll it anywhere, whereas a crate you have to pick up. So that's why barrels were, were the main way of storing both uh, liquids and solids. With liquids, what would happen is when they poured, after the barrel was made, they would pour water in it. Water would cause the wood to swell and all the seams in the barrel would close right up. So that's why they were able to store liquids in barrels. And they still do that in the whiskey industry. So that uh, that pretty much wraps up our collection of artifacts that we have here for the virtual tour. And we invite you 
uh, when, the, when we are able to open for personal visits to come and see what everything else we have and to come tour the keeper's house. So thank you. Farming in the 21st century is hard enough. I can't begin to imagine how difficult farming was in the 1800s with those frontier tools. Also in the annex, you'll see displayed some photos we have of the Wolcott children. Phoebe and Salima are Benaja's daughters from his first wife, Elizabeth, who died in Newburgh, Ohio. As we mentioned earlier, there is a family cemetery down the road behind the house. There you'll find the final resting place for Benaja Wolcott and other members of his family. His second wife, Rachel, is a bit of a mystery, and we have been unable to locate her final resting place. In addition to hearth cooking demonstrations, the Society has held a number of community events at the Keeper's House, including concerts, spinning wheel demonstrations, the Port Clinton perch wagon, and generally in October, a Civil War encampment. Again, we would like to thank you for watching this virtual tour of the Keeper's House and look forward to seeing you in person when we're next open. Please check our website for current visiting hours at www.ottawacountyhistory.org. Happy traveling!